This is Jean Deschamps. And William Beaubien Souligny. From the Université de Montréal. This is part of a series of video tutorials and reviews about venous congestion. This video will focus on the cardiac physiology and the hepatic vein assessment. The three other videos of the series will deal with portal vein Doppler, renal ultrasound, and integration of all venous congestion profiles. At the end of this video, you will be able to understand the basics of Doppler technique relating to venous congestion, understand the normal cardiac physiology and its impact on hepatic vein flow patterns, and understand pathological changes of cardiac physiology and the hepatic vein flow patterns. Fluid balance management is a challenging aspect of the care of patients with critical illness, congestive heart failure, or chronic kidney disease. This complex decision process relies on the integration of multiple sources of information and frequent re-evaluation of the patient's hemodynamic status. Venus Doppler ultrasound adds additional data to quantify and monitor over time the patient evolution. It enables the assessment of blood flow velocities within the peripheral veins, including the venous circulation, Venus Doppler profiles may provide information about systemic venous return and venous compliance, which may indirectly provide important insights into systemic congestion. Multiple locations can be interrogated with related differential diagnosis and diagnostic nuances. These will be covered in this series of videos. We will start with some basic technical and physiological concepts necessary for proper understanding of the assessment. The first technical consideration is understanding the two major types of Doppler ultrasonography and which applies to venous congestion assessment. For a more detailed overview, we will refer you to our round discussion presentation entitled Doppler Ultrasound Pitfalls and Hemodynamics. In summary, Doppler ultrasound functions by sending packets of sound waves at a specific wavelength and listening for the returning signal. The transducer performs calculations based on the wavelength shift to estimate velocity. The difference between continuous wave Dopplers, or CW Doppler, and pulse wave Doppler, or PW Doppler, is timing of pulses and listening pattern. Pulse wave Doppler sends a pack of signals and then stops sending signal to listen for the returning signal. As every emitted pulse is paired with a corresponding return signal, it is possible to determine where the reflection has occurred and calculate the distance of the reflector. In reverse, by defining a distinct region of interest, or sample volume, one is able to display returning signals from specific regions of, in the heart. The sampling gate is often drawn as two small lines perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. However, since there is a non-continuous listening, the maximal velocity that can be recorded will be limited. The CW Doppler sends and listen continuously using two separate crystals on the transducer. The absence of paired signals in this instance leads to not knowing which signal is reflected from which surface, leading to range ambiguity. The benefit is the absence of upper limit to the velocity that can be recorded. Given that venous congestion deals with flow velocity at a specific well-defined location, PW Doppler is used in preference to avoid range ambiguity. The second consideration is that proper assessment of venous Doppler profiles also requires a fundamental understanding of the cardiac and venous physiology. A major point is that flow is generated by a pressure differential between two points in the circulatory system. Flow ceases upon equilibration of those pressures, such as at the end of the filling of the receiving cavity. Accordingly, flow and velocities are related. Flow is a fluid volume transported over time, while velocities represent directional speed at a specific point in time. Velocity may thus be increased in the setting of a decreased duration of transit for a specific amount of blood volume like mitral stenosis. This may also happen when there are rapid equilibration of pressures after an initially high pressure differential like in aortic stenosis. 
We will now discuss the technical acquisition details related to proper assessment of venous congestion profiles and hepatic vein patterns. The preferred technique is through a lateral approach. The transducer will be oriented cephalocodal between the anterior and the mid axillary line. The beam will be angled at around 45 degrees, aiming a little bit right of the spine. The hepatic vein can be sampled from this location. Generally, this provides better alignment for post wave Doppler. Another benefit is easy access to the portal vein from a quick change in angulation. One important technical consideration is ensuring that there is a recorded ECG tracing on the machine. This is indeed difficult in case of pathology to properly identify each wave and avoid incorrect interpretation. A common confounder is misinterpreting a natural wave and a reversed systolic wave. We will now discuss cardiac physiology and hepatic vein tracings. To understand how venous Doppler profiles reflect the venous filling of the right atrium, we will analyze the hepatic vein tracings in the healthy individual in relation with right atrial pressure. By the end of diastole, the RA has been passively emptying into a compliant right ventricle and it sits at low filling pressure. Atrial systolic contraction results in a peak in the RA pressure reflected as the A wave. The tricuspid valve closes afterwards and the right atrium relaxes, resulting in the decreased right atrial pressure. After tricuspid valve closure, the RA is at its lowest filling volume. Ventricular systole causes the annulus to be pulled down, further expanding the right atrium and decreasing the RA pressure to its lowest in the entire cycle. This X descent represents the predominant filling period of the right atrium during the cardiac cycle. During ventricular systole, there is right atrium filling from the venous system with a progressive increase in RA pressure leading to the V wave, whose peak represents the second highest right atrial pressure. Upon tricuspid valve opening in diastole, the RA empties progressively and the RA pressure decreases, represented by the Y descent. Since the right atrium has been filling through the ventricular systole, it never becomes as empty during diastole as it does following atrial systole. This causes the Y descent to end at a higher pressure than the X descent. As described earlier, venous return is maximized when RA pressure is low. As such, there is interruption or reversal of flow when the RA pressure exceeds the hepatic vein pressures. During ventricular systole, the X descent on the RA pressure tracing corresponds to the systolic hepatic vein velocity, or S wave, on the hepatic vein tracing. Just prior to tricuspid valve opening in diastole, the increase in RA pressure leads to an interruption of flow in the hepatic vein, but seldom has retrograde flow in the healthy individual. Upon tricuspid valve opening, RA pressure decreases, leading to filling and increased forward flow as seen as the D wave. You'll notice that the S wave is generally of higher velocity than the D wave. This process denotes a normal pattern of flow in the hepatic veins. Physiologically, this is secondary to systolic atrial filling that is exacerbated by RA expansion during ventricular systole. In the healthy individual, retrograde flow only happens during atrial contraction or A wave and is reflected on the hepatic vein tracing by a small atrial reversal or AR wave. As described above, right atrial pressures do not go as low in the V descent as in the X descent and thus the S wave is generally at least as high as the D wave on the hepatic vein tracings. There are two periods during which the forward flow towards the right atrium is interrupted. First is between the S and D waves, which corresponds to the period just prior to tricuspid valve opening. At this moment, right atrial filling is completed. RA filling resumes upon tricuspid valve opening, an ejection of flow towards the right ventricle returns. The second is at the end of diastole, at which point the right atrial contraction leads to the reverse AR wave. As such, venous return is generally described as triphasic.
As rate atrial filling pressure increases, the rate atrial pressure changes in the predictable pattern reflected in the hepatic vein tracing. The X descent is less pronounced and ends at a higher pressure than in the LT subject. This is secondary to the loss of the right atrial reservoir function, since high right atrial pressure dilates the right atrium, minimizing the impact of the relaxation. This may also be exacerbated by the loss of tricuspid valve annular motion if right ventricular systolic dysfunction is present. The Y descent is more pronounced in the dysfunctional right heart, reflecting the initial higher diastolic pressure gradient from the right atrium to the right ventricle immediately after tricuspid valve opening. The early right ventricular diastolic pressure may be lower initially if the right ventricle is dilated and more compliant, leading to further exacerbation of the Y descent. These changes result in a depressed S-wave reflecting the reduced systolic integrate flow from the hepatic vein to the right atrium. The S-wave thus becomes smaller than the D-wave, a reversal of the normal pattern. With progressive increased right ventricular and diastolic pressure and right atrial pressure, the X descent will be significantly less pronounced and may be accompanied by an increased V wave in the presence of tricuspid regurgitation. As this continues to worsen, this change in the S wave can lead to complete reversal of the flow. The exact physiopathology is generally associated to tricuspid regurgitation. In this context, the ventricular ejection is transmitted to the right atrium and then to the hepatic vein. However, in certain situations, this may be present in advanced right ventricular systolic dysfunction. The exact physiopathology is unclear, but may be related to transmission of pressure through the closed tricuspid valve in the presence of an already very rigid and distended right atrium. The presence of a retrograde S-wave may thus be an helpful indicator of tricuspid regurgitation as a cause of increased right-sided pressure, but is not pathognomonic. So if we summarize, the hepatic vein waveform will consist of a first phase of atrial contraction or AR wave, followed by a systolic phase, which is usually dominant in the LT patient, and followed by a diastolic phase that will be of lesser velocity. As right sided pressures worsen, the systolic phase becomes initially blunted, but a diastolic phase is preserved. With very severe disease and functional tricuspid regurgitation, the AR wave and the S wave, or systolic wave, fuse to become an AV wave, reflecting the very advanced disease state. You will notice that the diastolic phase remains preserved and represents most of ventricular filling. We will now talk about confounders and issues with the technical acquisition and the interpretation of hepatic vein tracings. The changes found in the hepatic vein mirror the cardiac cycle pressure changes, as discussed above and inform about the pattern of venous return during the cardiac cycle. It must be noted that in case of an obstruction between the site of assessment and the right atrium, these Doppler patterns will be absent because the right atrial pressure will not be transmitted. This can happen during cardiac regional tamponade or hepatovene stenosis post-liver transplant. Instead, monophasic flow with no cardiac cycle-related variation will be observed. So in the next section, we'll uh, discuss the evidence and interpretation of the hepatic vein waveform. Hepatic vein waveform interpretation has been studied in heart failure and cardiac surgery patients. In these populations, a reduced testodic phase is associated with high right atrial pressure, with tricuspid regurgitation, and with reduced right ventricular systolic function. It is also more likely to be found during ventricular pacing. The key final messages you should retain from this presentation are that first, hepatic vein Doppler is a window into right-sided heart physiology. 
Second, that interpretation requires the use of an EKG tracing to prevent misinterpretation. And third, that a normal hepatic flow pattern makes RV failure and tricuspid regurgitation much less likely. This is the end of part one of our series of videos for venous congestion assessment. For a more detailed and extensive review of the physiology and evidence relating to its use, we would suggest to follow the following QR link to a review article that has recently been published. Feel free to contact us through our Twitter accounts with any question or comments. We hope you enjoyed this educational video.